Okay, so hi everybody, we're starting. Um, I will just remind you where we are. Um, we are still dealing with classical uh, density of states. And I will remind you the formula that we have written last week on the board, which is u to Gibbs. And the formula is that the partition function is 1 over some constant to the third power, OK? An integral over e to the minus beta, the Hamiltonian of the system, OK? And then we have to integrate over all the coordinates, dx, dy, dz, and all the momenta, dpx, dpy, and dpz. Um, what we managed to show, or we dealt a little bit with this formula, we actually basically haven't said a lot. What we managed to say is where it leads us and what is the density of states, or basically that we need to describe the energy and the particle is fluctuating around the minima, uh, and that the probability to be in a specific position, okay, uh, eventually is e to the minus beta and the energy of this position. Um, what I do want to show you now is how we actually can obtain this formula over here, which basically has absolutely no basis, right? He invented it, well, he had his own reason, Gibbs, and we are talking about 1875, okay, around this uh, time. Um, he had no idea what this constant is. We will see that this is actually a Planck constant. Um, so I won't tell you what exactly Gibbs was thinking when he developed this formula, but I do want to show you that if we start, if we start with a um, quantum mechanical description of waves, that we will eventually come up with this formula over here. Okay? So we will do the other way. We won't start from classical description and come to the quantum description, but we will actually start with the quantum description that we used so far as some sort of a postulate, or we developed it, at least for the canonical ensemble. And eventually, we will reach this formula. Right. So uh, what exactly we are doing? We are starting with the description of the partition function, which is of the form an integral e minus beta epsilon of omega, d prime of omega, d omega. So if we have specific volume, and um, the particles inside this volume we are describing as waves, quantum mechanical waves. So we do know that if there is a continuous spectrum of energies or continuous spectrum of frequencies, the partition function is of the following form. Right. And they used uh, the canonical ensemble in order to develop this formula previously. And we used this formula already for the uh, Debye model and for the black body radiation model. All of this we have seen. What we haven't seen is how we coming from this description to that description. All right, so what we actually do. First of all, we can say what is d of omega. Okay. It is the volume divided by 2 pi squared, k squared of omega, dk of omega, d omega. Okay. In, addition, in addition, we know that h bar for free waves, okay, for particles, h bar k equals to the momenta of the particles. Right. So if we want to talk about different momenta of the particles, they are proportional to the wave vector of those quantum mechanical waves up to a prefactor of h bar. OK, so at this point, we can state the following. First of all, what is this volume over here, V? So the volume V is always an integral over dx, dy, 
and dz. Right? If I have a specific uh, container of volume V, if I integrate over all this di the differential small parts volumes that, that uh, describe the container, eventually I will obtain the volume of the full body or the full container. So if I will substitute this result into this formula, I have e to the minus beta epsilon of omega, v divided by 2 pi squared, k squared of omega, dk of omega. So instead of volume over here, I will put this integration. So z equals to an integral. We'll have many other integrals over here e to the power minus beta epsilon of omega, 1 over 2 pi squared, k squared of omega, uh, dk of omega, dx, dy, and dz. OK. Now the next step is this integration of k squared of v omega dk of omega. What we can say is that we integrate over all possible case, right? We're um, in, uh, in order to obtain this partition function, we are integrating over all possible k squares of omega. So what it actually means, it means that I can, in using this formula over here, that h bar, h bar kp, okay? I can perform this substitution from k to p. Okay? So what do I have over here? k squared of omega is transformed into p squared, okay, my total momenta, divided by h bar. Okay? dk of omega transformed into dp, okay, divided by h bar. So in total, all this formula is transformed into z equals, so I have integration over dx, I have an integration over different k, e minus beta epsilon of omega, okay, 1 over 2 pi squared, p squared divided by h bar squared, 1 over h bar, and here I have dp, dx, dy, and dz. So first of all, this epsilon here is the total energy of the system. So instead of writing e to the power minus beta epsilon of omega, I can write sim simply e to the minus beta of the Hamiltonian. Okay? Uh, another thing is, well, to notice the following expression. 4 pi p squared dp, okay, it is what? It is simply a, some sort of a Jacobian, all right, in, uh, in what coordinates? Spherical. spherical coordinates, right? In spherical coordinates, and I can simply say that this is dpx, dpy, and dpz. Okay. So another transformation is transformation of this differential to dpx, dpy, and dpz. Okay. And eventually, I'm getting what? That p squared dp equals 1 over 4 pi dpx, dpy, and dpz. Okay? And now we can write that I have z is an integral. I have a, a lot of integrations over here. e to the minus beta, my Hamiltonian, epsilon of omega is Hamiltonian. Okay, this is simply the total energy. Here I have 1 over 2 pi squared multiplied by 1 over h bar to the third. And pi squared dp is simply 1 over 4 pi. Okay, dpx, dpy, dpz dx, dy, dz, okay? and we are coming to this solution 
where it is equals to 1 over 2 pi h bar to the third and integrals of e to the power minus beta, the Hamiltonian, dpx, dpy, dpz, dx, dy, dz. Okay. And the only transformation that is left is the transformation from h bar to h Planck constant. And as you remember, h bar is Planck constant divided by 2 pi. Okay. H bar is h divided by 2 pi. And what we are getting from here is that z equals 1 over h to the third power, a bunch of integrals of e to the power minus beta, the Hamiltonian of the system. Okay, and here dpx, dpz, dx, dz. So this is exactly the formula okay, that was derived by Gibbs way, way before quantum mechanics is, was even thought of. Okay, way before people started even to think about waves, the Broly waves, and etc., etc., etc. So there is nothing like quantum mechanics even in any kind of a mind that is living back then. And still, this formula is exactly the formula that we will obtain if we look on a bunch of waves, quantum mechanical waves that somehow interact inside a closed volume. Uh, the only thing that is different is that we know explicitly that this is what this is, right? This is Planck constant to the third power. Gibbs had no idea what this constant is. He advocated that, well, this constant should be determined from experiment. What exactly this constant is, he had no idea. Okay. Now, it is nice that, this, that classical mechanics okay, is very simply transformed into, or statistical physics, of cla classical statistical physics is very simply transformed into the statistical physics, which is quantum. Okay? The transformation is pretty simple. Um, how can we understand a little bit what's happen over, happening over here? Because, look, this description, we integrate over phase space, right? We integrate over the coordinates and the momentum. Now, the integral is clear, but how we learn what is statistical physics, what is partition function? We started with this, this notion that there are different states, right? So the system uh, or our phase space is separated into very specific strict space. We wanted to understand what is the probability to occupy a given state, okay? The spectrum was discrete. We started with a discrete state. Okay. Each state had its own energy, E, right? and we counted over all possible states. Here we integrate over, over these different, I don't know, uh, regions of phase space. It's not exactly as counting over space. Okay? But the idea of Gibbs was pretty similar, and we can understand it a little bit more. If you look only on one-dimensional system. Okay. So what is, what is the partition function if we're looking only in one-dimensional system? So we have an integration over dpx, dp, uh, dx, right? e to the power minus beta, the Hamiltonian. And here we have h. Yep. No. So the general formula is valid. Our derivation is not. OK? So the general formula is still valid, but this, this form of obtaining this formula, starting from uh, a class or a quantum mechanical description, is not valid. 
I can generalize it to a Hamiltonian which is dependent on explicitly on positions, okay, and it will still work. But for free particles, it's the easiest way, right? Um, okay, so this formula, this formula of Gibbs for a classical state, it basically counting or integrating over all my phase space, right? And if we think about it, what is this guy over here? Okay. So this guy is in some sense is um, it's variables of integrations, but we can think about it in a slightly different fashion. So let's assume that we have, this is our phase space. So here is Px, here is our x. Now, our motion is limited. Let's assume that our motion is limited. Okay? And we can occupy, or can be present only in a very specific okay, portion of the phase space. So all this black, blackish uh, background is the positions or the portions of the phase space where the system can be obs uh, observed. Anything outside of this are states that the system will never reach there. For example, a pendulum, okay, a pendulum can go from a maximal, uh, uh, a maximal angle to a min minus maximal angle, and it can only have a maximal momenta. So there is a squarish or a round or elliptic uh, fa uh, shape for this allowed portions of the phase space. But let's assume that this is our phase space. So what this formula tells us, okay? This formula tells us you have to integrate over all this phase space. So what, what do we mean by integration? Okay. We mean by integration that we can divide all this phase space, the allowed phase space, into small squares of size px, dpx, multiplied by dx, right? right. So we divide. It's exactly as we define integration. So we divide all the phase space into small squares, right? Into small squares. And then we calculate what is e to the power minus beta h for a given square, OK? And we multiply, and we multiply the size of this small square by this function e to the minus beta h. And we count all the possible squares. The problem with this approach, in quantum mechanics, it works. Why it works? Because we have a definite, specific number of states. We can simply count over, over them. What happens here? You can say, well, Stas, you have taken a very specific sizes for dpx. Right? This is dpx. This is dx. Right? If you're going into the continuum limit, let's make, make everything smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. This constant over here is in some sense determines what is the minimal separation in the phase space that we, are, we can reach. Why? Because in quantum mechanics, we have this relation delta px multiplied delta x greater than h, okay, up to some constant, but it's enough. So there is the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. Okay? The uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics says you cannot determine the position and the momentum of a particle at the same time beyond a specific limit. Okay, beyond a specific uncertainty. So when I'm starting to divide my phase space into squares, I cannot proceed with this procedure okay, into smaller and smaller, smaller, smaller squares. I have to stop somewhere. And this is why the appearance of this 1 over h in the Gibbs expression. Okay? He had no idea about that. He had no idea about the uncertainty principle. Right? But he's thought that, well, I have some, I need somehow to determine those small squares, okay, and the sizes of those small squares 
um, of my phase space. Okay? He basically said what this expression means. That the size of, my of, of this guy, dpx, multiplied by dx divided by h is the total is the total number of minimal states that can be pushed inside my single square over here. I cannot go beyond this limit, right? I cannot say, well, there is infinitely many number of subdivisions that I can perform. dpx divided by dx divided by h is, in some sense, the density, the maximal density of states that can be in each square. So this is some sort of a relation to quantum mechanics and why H appears there. Gibbs had no idea about that. He had no idea that there should be some sort of a minimal uncertainty principle. Um, but he obtained this from some completely general prescription thinking about gases and uh, other models. OK, so um, questions about that? OK, let's see how we can use this notion of uh, canonical ensemble and the partition, fu uh, partition function for classical system in order to derive something which is quite simple. So let's derive the partition function of an ideal gas. Okay. So how we should derive this? First of all, there are particles that are not interacting. Right? This is the assumption of ideal gas. They only interact through the walls. Right? So when I'm writing z okay, to some power of an integral e minus beta h dpx dpy dpz dx dy dz 1 over h to the third right this is the partition function according to gibbs this is this is the partition function right the only thing that i need to know is that an integral of dx, dy, and dz, okay? This integral equals to the volume, right? This I know. So the total volume of the system is v. Another thing that I know is what is the Hamiltonian of the system? The Hamiltonian of the system, it's three particles that are bounded in a box. What is ideal gas? bunch of n particles that are sitting somehow in a box, okay? They're sitting in a box. The volume of this box is n, is, is I'm sorry, is v, and they are free, completely free particles. So the Hamiltonian is p x squared divided by 2m plus p y squared divided by 2m plus p z squared divided by 2m. So first of all, we see that our Hamiltonian is independent of the position. So our formula works pretty well. OK. So what do we know? We know that z, so we can perform right away the integration with respect to dx, dy, and dz, and obtain this volume over here. right? So we have 1 over h to the third power. We have here three integrals. We have here volume, e to the power minus beta px squared divided by 2m, e to the power minus beta py squared divided by 2m, multiplied by e to the power minus beta pz squared divided by 2m dpx, dpy, and dpz. 
Now, P's can be absolutely anything, right? We are not assuming some specific velocity. We don't know what the velocity of the particles is. We're assuming that the only thing that we know is that the particles are bounded in the box. The velocities of those particles can be whatever they like. Okay? So Px going from minus infinity to infinity. Py goes from minus infinity to infinity. And Pz goes from minus infinity to infinity. <coughs> now look, here we have a triple integration. But all the integrands are completely independent of each other. Okay? And they're ex simply, ex they're exactly the same. Right? So this triple integration is basically one single integration to the third power. Okay? What I'm claiming is that z, z equals 1 h to the third, the volume, an integration from minus infinity to infinity, e minus beta px squared divided by 2m dpx, to the third power. Okay? That's it. Shh. Okay. What we do from here, we solve this integral. Right? So uh, do you want to prove what this integral is? The integration is from minus infinity to infinity, e to the power minus beta px squared divided by 2m dpx equals to square root of pi to m beta. Do you remember how to prove what the Gaussian integral is? Yep, yep. So what do you do? The technique is as follows. You look on this integration and you basically say, well, this is a px or x, it doesn't matter. I multiply it by exactly the same integration with very similar coordinate. And then I transform everything to spherical coordinates. I change the Jacobian to something else. And voila, it is solved. It's actually pretty easy. There's a very nice book on differential geometry by Spivak. So he, in his foreword, he writes how he defines a mathematician. So his de definition of a mathematician is whoever knows how to solve this integral, and for him it's like 1 plus 1 equals 2, this is his definition of a mathematician. So if you know how to solve this integral and it's pretty easy for you, you can consider you a mathematician. Okay, so we know this integral over here. Don't worry, I don't need you to be mathematicians. Okay, so we're having this z equals to v to h, bar, to, h to the third power. Okay, multiply by a square root of 2 pi m divided by beta. Okay. Now, this is to the, to the power of 3. Yes, thank you. To the power of 3. Yes. So this is the partition function of what? This is a partition function of one single particle in a box. Okay. Now, if I have many particles and they're completely non-interacting, their partition function, we can call it, this is z1, 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 okay? Because it's a z1, because it's a partition function for a single particle. z is z1 to n, right? We don't care where all particles are located. They are completely non-interacting. This is the idea of ideal gas. The particles are not interacting. They are pushing on the chambers, on the gaseous chamber. They interact through the pressure on the walls. For us, it does, completely doesn't matter. So the total partition function is the nth power of the partition function for a single particle. Okay? So what do we get? Is that the partition function is v to the n, h to 3n, and 2 pi m divided by beta, 3 halves n. Okay. This is the partition function. 
We'll see in a couple of minutes that this is actually really problematic partition function, but let us see that at least we're getting the equation of state of ideal gas, right? Because eventually we do want to get whatever is observed in an experiment. And what is observed in an experiment for an ideal gas? PV equals NK Boltzmann T. Right? Somehow from this guy, and those people already know even in 1875, they already know what is the partition, what is the uh, function of state of an ideal gas. So at least in order to try this formula of Gibbs, we need to come from the partition function into the equation of state. Let us do it. Good. Okay, so how we proceed, how we can calculate the equation of state. We know the partition function. What is the next step? To calculate the free energy. Right? If we know the partition function, we know how to calculate the free energy. And the free energy is F equals minus 1 over beta log of z. Okay. The moment I know the free energy, I know how to determine pressure. Because what is pressure? Minus df to dv is going to be pressure. This is the usual stuff of thermodynamics. So the first goal is always to, to obtain some potential. Energy, free energy, entropy, something. Okay. And in the canonical representation, the obvious thing to do is to calculate the free energy because the equation is very simple. All right, so it is minus 1 over beta. And here we have a log of v to the power n divided by h to the 3 n's, 2 pi m divided by beta, 3 halves n. OK. So we can take n outside, and we are getting that f equals minus 1 over beta. 1 over beta is k bolt on t. Minus k bolt on t multiplied by n, a log of v, multiply 1 over h to the third power, 2 pi m to beta to the power of 3 halves. Okay, so this is this is our free energy. Okay. The next step is what is pressure? Now pressure is P equals minus DF to DV. Okay. Remember that pressure enters energy as minus PDV when we transform from the energy to the Helmholtz free energy. Simply, it's U minus TS. So F equals to DTS minus PDV. Okay? So minus P is DF to DV. And this is the relation. Okay? Now when we take the derivative of this guy with respect to V, it is so DF to DV equals minus k Boltzmann t n d to dv of log of v plus a log of 1 over h to the third power 2 pi m divided by beta to the, thir to the 3 halves. Okay. Now when we take a derivative of this guy, this is simply 1 over v. Okay, and the derivative of v with respect of this uh, with respect of with v of this guy is zero, so we obtain that df to dv equals to minus k Boltzmann t n divided by v. Okay, p equals to minus df to dv, and we finally obtain that. P V equals to K Boltzmann T N. Okay. So this is the equation of ideal gas. Do you agree with me? Yes. yes. Have I done something wrong? 
No, no, I haven't cheated you actually. Well, I had, and it's not me, it's Gibbs, we had cheated you, but not in the equation. So the equation is correct, the derivation is correct, everything works fine, and this is why, in the first place, Gibbs started to write his, uh, uh, this partition function because you have to, to remember, their starting point is not what we are teaching you right now, their starting point is this equation of state. They wanted to generalize it. They wanted to make use of those free energies, etc., etc., etc. So all of what they have done is a generalization. What we are trying to de describe to you is let's start from a very general expression, take some derivative, and eventually get this function of state. But there is a very big problem on the board, right? And this problem is actually related to the problem that you've got in your quiz. Right? So remember in the quiz, the first question was, what is the right free energy? Right? So some of you got it correct, some of you have had it wrong, it doesn't really matter. Okay? But there are two relations okay, between entropy and energy. And what is relevant to us is that energy is extensive quantity. Okay, not intensive, but extensive. It also means that the free energy is also an extensive quantity. Okay. Now, if we look on this guy, okay, so great, it is proportional to n, almost extensive. The problem is this v over here. Right? Why v? Okay, so if we take two systems and we attach them together, right? and this, those, two, those two systems are exactly the same, the free energy is not going to grow by a factor of two because of the presence of a log of v over here. Okay? Because v is going to be log of v and log of v and they are going to multiply each other. Okay? So it's going to be of log of 2v. Right? So if I have two, two systems and I attach them together and I sum up their free energies, the total free energy is not going to be twice this free energy. Now this is a problem. This is a very serious problem for Professor Gibbs. Okay? Uh, and this is why it's called a Gibbs paradox in some sense. This is the starting point. You have taken free particles. Okay? You can say what, what are the free particles. I can have molecules or I can have small balls in a um, big chamber, okay? big box. They are somehow interacting. I counted all their possible states Right? I summed up over all their different positions and I came, came up with a quantity which is not extensive. Okay? So the moment I will have to do it twice for two different systems, I will get another answer. For three systems that I somehow add together, I will get another answer. Okay? The equation of state is great. Yep. The equation of the state is great. The problem is the presence of V over here. Okay. So Gibbs thought about it as a paradox. Why a paradox? Because his solution was a mathematical solution and he had no idea why this works. So what the solution of Gibbs was? Okay. Uh, this is a, a great solution. When you have something which is a problem, usually you solve it by trying to push something inside so the math will work, but you have no idea why it works. Okay. An example, for example, dark mass in astrophysics. Right. You get a prediction of your model, okay? you measure something, and you have a discrepancy of 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, and you say, well, it doesn't work because I haven't accounted for all the mass. I don't see this mass, let's call it dark mass, or dark energy. This is the same idea. So the idea of dark mass, dark energy, or something that I don't understand by the mass should work, okay, is a very old one. Gibbs said, well, everything will work, absolutely everything, if I put 1 over n over here, if eventually in my calculations I will come up with a free energy that looks like this, everything will work. Why it will work? If I now take the derivative of f, I still get the same PV equals k Boltzmann Tn, right? Because okay, I will only have an additional term of minus log of n, right? and I take the derivative of with dv, it disappears, 
So the equation of state stays the same. The equation here is extensive, right? Because this is density, V divided by N. I have one system with density A, I have another system with density A, I add them up together, this is still, I have twice as many number of particles, but the densities are the same, so the free energy grows by a factor of two. Great. How on earth I should get everything so that I will get one over n over here? Gibbs thought and thought and thought, and he came up with the following solution. He said the following, well, I'm clever enough to put this one over n over here, but this is not my starting point. What is my starting point? This z1 over here, or more specifically, this guy. Okay. Now Gibbs that why on earth? And I actually this is the this is where I cheated. This is where I cheated. Okay. Uh, why on earth? This is only to the power n. Okay. Well, it's the power n because I'm uh, counting all the possible states. Now let's assume that I have many particles in my inside my box. So this is my box. And I have many particles. Now, remember, this is classical physics, so this is not quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, I don't know who is who. I have to write the wave function that will include all the particles, and when I change their position, something happens to the wave function. Uh, there are peculiar stuff, but in classical physics, this guy I call Stas, this guy I call Michael, and I know who is Stas and who is Michael. I can follow them up as they move around, right? I can determine their position as a function of time. I have infinite precision. There is nothing as uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics, okay? I, I can follow them up. Now, Gibbs said, well, what I need is the following. I counted all the different positions, okay? All the different positions of the different particles. Now, if I will take Stas and swap it with Michael, Okay, I take those two particles, that's stars will be red, Michael will be purple, and we'll swap them. The particles are completely identical. I am swapping these two particles. In classical mechanics, it's a new state. Okay, it's new position, it's the new state. Okay, but if the particles are completely identical, are completely identical, the total state is exactly the same. So Gibbs thought, well, maybe this is the problem, okay? He said the following, so Z is Z1 to the power n, all the possible conformations of each of, each of those particles to the power n, but I have to divide by the total number of permutations of all the particles. Why? Because when I'm swapping them, it's not a new state. But this is a paradox because it is a new state. Because previously Stas was here and Michael there. I swapped it and hop, I have what I have. I have Stas over here and Michael over there. It's a new state. If I don't know who is Michael and who is Stas, right, then I may be right, but I can know. I can follow them up. I can add particles one by one, name them, follow them for the to all the time, okay? And this is going to be a different state. Gibbs had no idea, but we will see that we, when he introduced this prefactor over here, he got this nice one over n over here, and everything worked, okay? So let's see that this is actually what happens, right? And I'm not just cheating you again. So what do we have? We have Z is 1 over N. Z1 to the N. F equals minus 1 over beta log of Z. 
solve f equals minus k Boltzmann t log of okay 1 over n factorial z1 to the power n what is equals to it equals to minus k Boltzmann t of log of z1 n z1 minus log of n factorial now remember what is one of n factorial n log n minus n so log of n factorial is n log n minus n okay so we put it inside over here and we're having that f equals to minus k Boltzmann t n log of Instead of z1, we let's put the whatever we have. So this is, uh, yep. So let's put it. Let's take it step step by step. So here we have log of v to the power n divided by h to the three n two pi m divided by beta. 3 over 2n, this is a closing bracket of the log, okay? So this is the log, and here we have minus this formula over here, minus n log n plus n. Okay, so we are having that f equals minus k Boltzmann t n. So here we can take n outside of the log, and here we also have minus n log n. So we, in general, having n log of v divided by n, okay, multiplied by 1 over h to the 3n. 2 pi m divided by beta to 3 halves, two, right? So this is this, this is this, min plus n, and we're closing the brackets. Okay, so let's see. Let's see. We're, we got exactly the same formula over here, up to an additional form of minus k bolts on tn. So the, this stuff is still extensive. It still works. There is v divided by n. So everything is great. Okay? So now Gibbs is happy. We are happy. But we have a paradox. What is the paradox? We have to divide by the total number of permutations. We have no idea. We can follow the particles. The particles are classical particles. We don't even know what quantum mechanics is. right? But we're saying if we have two particles, this is A, this is particle B, this is one state. I swap them, this is still the same state, although they are different. Yep. It's supposed to be just the 3 and the 3, okay, thanks. Great. This is part of the Gibbs paradox. He solved it, he solved the problem, he had mathematically right calculations now, everything works, everything is extensive, everything is self-consistent, except that I have no idea why I'm doing this. Okay? And sometimes this is the situation in physics. Okay? Now, why I have no idea? Because I'm using classical systems. And quantum mechanics sometimes determines also the behavior at high temperatures, specifically where we are talking about statistics. Okay? So here, remember, we, we had to count all the different states. Okay? So we needed actually to know what a state is. So he had no idea what a state is. He's just summed up over everything. But way, way down here, we counted over all the different states of the system. And we have to know either what kind of statistics we are using. Because remember, in quantum mechanics, there are fermions and bosons. Fermions cannot occupy the same state. 
bosons can occupy the same state. And somehow all of this okay, goes up and ends down, ends in this formula over here. And ends in non-extensivity. So we have somehow counted everything wrong. Right? This is the problem. So in order to solve it, so there is no paradox whatsoever. The answer is Gibbs formula is simply not correct. We will see it anywhere. So you can make this correction and it will work. Okay? But the problem with the Gibbs formula is that deep down our world is quantum and not classical. And when we try to write down different functions, partition functions, we have to keep in mind we're talking about photon, we're talking about what kind of particles? Photon is a boson, okay? Electron is a fermion. And this is something that we always need to remember. Yeah? How can you quantize, for example, volume? Sorry? How can you, for example, quantize volume? Yes, but I have to, I, I'm, I'm not quantizing volume without particles. I'm quantizing the different states of the different particles. Okay? That's, that's I, this I can do. You can say, well, those particles, the problem is the following. When you have in quantum mechanics two particles and you switch them, your, part, your wave function uh, have to satisfy specific properties, symmetric or anti-symmetric. Remember? Okay. So on this, this is what is important. Okay? So when you're performing your quantization, when you're counting states, this property, symmetric and, non -symm and asymmetric uh, properties of your wave functions, is, uh, enters your quantization and how you count different states. I, I will show you in a second. Any further questions? Okay. Yep. If we were, if we would rock it both, how this, how this would work out the end? Yes. If you will start from a quantum mechanical description, everything will work out. I, I will, I will show you in an example. Okay. Let, let me show you in an example. So let's assume that I have two particles and two boxes. Okay? Two particles, two boxes. Particle can be classical particle, quantum particle, boson, fermion. A box is a state. Okay. Now I'm starting to count what is the total number of different states that I have inside my system. So I can have a state when particle number one, so those are my particles, one and two. I can name them, I can name them Stas and Michael, I can name them uh, 1 and 2, it doesn't matter. Okay, so I can, ha I can have a situation when particle number 1 in box A, particle number 2 in box B. Okay, what else can I have? I can have the other way around, particle number 2 in box A, particle number 1 in box B. I can have the situation where particle number 1 and particle number 2 are in box A, or I can have a situation where particle number one and particle number two are in box B. Okay? Now, when I'm counting this, I'm saying I have four different states. Four different states. Gibbs says, well, the total number of states is not four. It is what? It's four divided by two factorial, which is exactly two. There are two different states over here. This is what Gibbs says to us. Two different states. Okay. What happens if I have not classical statistics, but quantum statistics? So we have two different situations. Fermions and bosons. Now, the only thing that you need to remember about fermions and bosons, forget about this anti-symmetric and symmetric properties of the wave function, is fermions can be exactly in the same state. Oh, I'm sorry. Bosons can be exactly in the same state. Fermions cannot. We will use this property extensively when we will describe quantum fluids. Okay. Let's, for now, 
perform the same simple computation for fermions. Fermions, two particles, two boxes. Okay. I have box A and box B. Now remember, quantum mechanics particles are indis indistinguishable, indistinguishable, indistinguishable. Okay. So I have a particle over here, and when I have a particle over here, the other one. Well, it has to be somewhere. It cannot sit over here. So it has to be in the other box. I don't have any other states. Okay? I cannot swap them. I cannot do anything. Okay? When, whenever one state is occupied, the other state is occupied as well. So the total number of states when one box and the other box is occupied. The total number of states over here is 1. Okay. So you see, the Gibbs calculation for two particles is already wrong from the quantum mechanical perspective of fermions. What happens if I have bosons? Okay, again, two particles, two boxes. The, par <coughs> the particles are indistinguishable. Okay, so box A box B. So we have a situation when one of the particles in box A, the other particle is in box B. I cannot swap them. They are completely the same. So this is one state. The other state is two of the particles are in box A. I have an additional state because they can occupy exactly the same state and a box is a state for a particle. I can also have a situation when the two particles occupy the second box. So in total number of states for this system is three. Okay. So one, two, and three. So what we see that Boltzmann statistics in somewhere in between, between the fermion behavior, okay, and the boson behavior. But this is wrong, intrinsically wrong. Why it's wrong? Because Gibbs was trying to solve a problem of extensivity. Okay, so he just pushed something inside and hoped that it worked. It's really close to the, gen to the true solution. But in order to solve it completely, we have to account for quantum statistics. Gibbs had no idea what's quantum statistics. Now, what I can tell you that why Gibbs formula works, because eventually we got the proper behavior of the, of the function of the state, PV equals NK Boltzmann T. The answer is, in high temperatures, high enough temperatures, this statistics and this statistics and the other statistics is basically the same, almost the same. Why? Because the probability that two particles okay, are occupying very small portion of the phase space is extremely small. They're really, really hot. They're wandering all around. Okay? So basically, in this limit of high enough temperatures, and when I'm telling you okay, it's not so low, high enough is not zero, but also not 1,000 kelvins. Okay? In this limit of high enough temperatures, the statistics of Gibbs is basically the same as statistics of uh, fermions and statistics of bosons. Be why? Because those states, those states are basically negligible. Okay? The probability of observing two particles exactly in the same proximity, in the same box, okay? in very close proximity, in the same box, is really, 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 really small. Okay? So we can neglect these states absolutely. So the total number of states is one and one, and also here it's going to be one. Why? Because we are neglecting the states when they're all together. Under this condition, we divide by the number of permutations, and everything work, works as a charm. Okay? This is only why. Well, one can say it's maybe a coincidence, but it's not exactly a coincidence, because he had this mathematical prescription of what he should do in order to make everything work, okay? to push this 1 over n inside. 
<coughs> so what we will continue to do, um, maybe not today, but actually what we will continue to do is, um, is to treat everything in quantum mechanical fashion. Right? So uh, our next step, well, next next step is going to be quantum fluids and there we want to use explicitly either this statistics of fermions of this statistics of bosons. Why? Because we see that it's important. We cannot assume some general properties. We don't care about quantum mechanics. No, we always need to care about it when we're talking about statistics. Why? Because our prescription is to count states. And the properties of the different states are different from fermions and bosons. We will see that for systems of electrons, okay, even though we are talking about room temperatures, the properties, conduction properties of electrons, of metals, are going to be highly dependent on the fact that we are treating fermions and not bosons. Okay? Although we are going to talk about something that can happen in a room temperature, the fact that we are talking about fermions and they cannot occupy exactly the same state, okay, it goes all the way up from zero temperature to something which is room temperature. Why? Because it's a very strict restriction. You cannot occupy exactly the same state. When you count the state, you have to count them in a very specific fashion. The same goes for bosons. When we're going to, to observe systems of photons, which are bosons, for example, it's going to behave exactly in the same fashion. You can count different states. They can occupy different states, so your counting procedure is different. Okay? This is because we are counting states. Okay? And this is very important how you count. Okay, so the last thing uh, that I want to mention before going into quantum fluids Oh, it's uh, my fault. There is uh, the disorder. So way before quantum fluids, we are going to we, we are going to describe disorder. Um, another thing is something that I already mentioned to you, but I just need want you to remind to remind it to you is of classical statistics is the equipartition theorem. What is equipartition theorem? This is something that sh that is based on uh, the statistics of <coughs> the statistics of uh, Gibbs. So let's assume that our Hamiltonian, okay, is a function. A quadratic function of the position, okay? And we have here p squared divided by 2m. Okay. So basically we're looking on a system of a single particle which is bound by a harmonic potential. Okay, so this is our position, x. This is u of x. Okay. This is the potential, it's a square function. Okay. And you can imagine our particle is basically bouncing on top of this potential from left to right. Okay. The energy is not restricted, it's not a problem of classical mechanics when I put a line over here and saying, well, this is the maximal x, this is the minimal x. No, I can be anywhere I want. Okay. I can be anywhere I want. And the probability to observe the particle in a specific position is e to the minus beta multiplied by a x squared. Okay. So the particle simply wanders around. Now, for this system, I have two degrees of freedom. One degree of freedom is this x, okay, which is provided to me by my harmonic potential. The other degree of freedom in the phase space in the p. Okay. I can be wherever I want on the axis of x, and I can be wherever I want on the axis of p. 
of px. So I have an unbound phase space, two degrees of motion, x and p's. Okay. So let us see what is the partition function of a single particle, classical single par particle, um, in this Gibbs formalism. Yep. Sorry, change green is bad? OK, thanks. Blue, OK. All right. So what is z, z1? It is this integral, 1 over h to the third. 1 over h, I'm sorry, because we have only two dim uh, one dimension over here. An integral, double integral, e minus beta ax squared minus beta p squared divided by 2m, okay, dx and dp. Okay. So we have here two integrals. 1 over h to 1 half, an integral of e to the power minus beta ax squared dx, and an integral of 1 over h to 1 half, e to the power minus beta p squared 2m dp. This. Now integration is over all the space. I have two degrees of freedom, they are completely free, so here it's minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity. All right? No. Yep. No? Fine. Great. Um, OK. Now, we are already all mathematicians over here, so we know what this integration is. So we have 1 over h to 1 half. This guy is a square root of pi divided by beta a, OK? And this guy is 1 over uh, h to 1 half, a square root of pi divided by beta multiplied by 2m. Fine? No? Great. energy is minus 1 over beta log of z1. The free energy of this one single particle okay, is simply a log of z1. So we can write it down as okay, uh, minus k Boltzmann t okay, a log of 1 h to 1 half square root of pi divided by beta a, so let's write it down as a k Boltzmann t, multiplied by 1 over h to 1 half, a square root of pi k Boltzmann t, multiplied by 2m. Okay, and we close it down. Okay. So the only thing that it's important over here, the only thing that it's important over here is what? Is that we have minus one half k Boltzmann t, okay, a log of k Boltzmann t. We have from this guy minus one half a k Boltzmann t a log of k Boltzmann t, okay? And we have a bunch of all other stuff, which is minus k Boltzmann t, a log of 1 over h, a square root of pi divided by a, multiplied a square root of pi multiplied by 2m, divided by nothing. So it's like this.
I remind you two connections. So first of all, S is minus DF to DT. This is the first one. And CV is T DS to DT. When we perform this calculation, this is CV, when we perform those calculations, we obtain that CV equals this guy will contribute one half K Boltzmann. This guy will contribute one half K Boltzmann. And this is the statement of the equipartition theorem. The equipartition theorem states the following. You started with a system that had two degrees of freedom and you compute and you compute your specific heat. Each degree of freedom is going to contribute exactly one half K Boltzmann. Okay? Exactly one half K Boltzmann. What it means, it means that I already plotted you this 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 before. When I plot this specific heat, I will sometimes will see that the it saturates on a specific value. Okay? When I plot as a function of temperature, this CV, it will saturate on a specific value as a function of T. Now, this specific value is going to be always what? number of degrees of freedom that you have in your system multiplied by one half k Boltzmann. It will always be like that due to this equipartition theorem because eventually I can say as I heat up the system all the different degrees of freedom become decoupled from each other okay like over here okay. and each of them when they are decoupled is going to contribute one half k Boltzmann I have n particles, each of them have two degrees of freedom, so I'm going to have a saturation around n multiplied by k Boltzmann. We have seen this for the Einstein model and the Debye model. Okay? This is an outcome of this Gibbs theory of Hickel partition theorem. Thank you. Um, now, so when I'm plotting, I'm calculating CV from the experiment, okay? And I'm looking, well, it's saturated on a specific value. What I know, I know the number of degrees of freedom that I have in my system. Sometimes I start to see the following thing. So this saturation suddenly, it, the function rises up and then saturates again. What happened over here? I can ha say that this is some sort of a T melting. Why? Because, well, I had structures inside my system. I heat it up. At some point, those structures started to break. How they can break? So the molecules can start to vibrate, okay? And this adds another degree of freedom. Or they are not vibrating. After a while, that if they are even not vibrating. But they are breaking up again into some additional pieces, and etc., etc., etc. So each time that I see this step, in the specific heat, I know that I somehow broke an internal structure, an additional degree of freedom appeared in the system. Okay? And this is something that I can always look for. And I know that, well, I know the structure of the system or some sort of a, what is happening inside. And the only thing that I need to actually do, okay, it's not to break the system, not to look on upon it in a microscope, but simply heat it up and measure the specific heat of the system. The degree of the specific heat and the behavior of the specific heat, the temperature, tells me something about what is going on inside from this classical uh, perspective over here. Okay, so this is the last thing that uh, we need to know about classical systems. Uh, any questions? No. So what we are going to do now, we are going at least to start to talk about disorder. Before quantum fluids, I have to teach you something about disorder.
entropy and the measure of disorder. So we started from thermodynamical part in, uh, in this class. Uh, if you remember the first two or three, even four lectures, was about thermodynamics. We described the first law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics. And then we said we have entropy. And we really do not have ideas up to now what entropy is, unless we are using the formulas that we are reading on the board. Right? So the only thing that we know that entropy A is function which is uh, increasing as a function of the energy of the system. This we know. Also what we know, we know that in equilibrium, entropy is at its maximum. Okay? This is a postulate of the second, uh, second law of thermodynamics. Um, but what exactly this entropy is? Okay? So remember, when we've been looking on microcanonical, microcanonical, ensemble, we stated the following. Omega was the total number of states that we have in our system. Now, microcanonical ensemble is an ensemble where each state have equal probability. Okay? So the probability to be in state number i was 1 over the total number of states. Right? So fi equals 1 over omega. Now the next step in order to describe something and to calculate something from this very simplistic ensemble, we said, well, we would like to write down what entropy is. Okay? And I somehow managed to convince you that entropy, in order to keep this extensive property, etc., etc., that entropy is simply K Boltzmann log of omega. Okay? So the logarithm of the number of state of the system is log of it is simply was the entropy. How it is exactly related to this other notion that we mentioned in the first law of thermodynamics was not exactly clear. Sometimes we are saying, well, the system is very disordered, less disordered. And somehow we know that the disorder is related to this entropy over here. What is a disorder and what it has to do with the k boson multiplied by the log of the number of states? It's also not clear so far. Okay. Moreover, the description of energy for canonical ensemble was really different. Okay. I don't remember if you have written it, but definitely the entropy for canonical ensemble is not provided by this formula over here. What is entropy for canonical ensemble? Okay. So I will just remind you that, first of all, the probability to be in state i in canonical ensemble is e to the minus beta ei. ei is the, is the energy of state i multiplied by 1 over z. z is a sum over i e minus beta ei. Okay. So this is, was our starting point. We had no idea what entropy is. Microcanonical ensemble was defined, was based on what is entropy. Canonical ensemble, on the other hand, was based on what? Was based completely on microcanonical ensemble. Remember, we had built a big system, we had a reservoir, and we had small systems, and we did some magic over there, and eventually we got this formula. But what is entropy? Okay. Is this entropy? Let's see. OK, so first of all, the free energy is E minus Ts. Okay? So entropy should appear in this formula over here. So we can take S and say that S equals to E divided by T with minus. I'm sorry, with plus, minus f divided by t. OK. So what is f? f is minus 1 over beta log of z. OK. 
What is E? E is a sum of I, Fi multiplied by Ei. E, the energy, is the average energy of the system. So it basically says, says to us, what is the average energy of the system? Is the probability to be in state I multiplied by the value of the energy for this specific state I summed up over all the different states. Okay, so we are having this two formula inside. Okay. So in order to say what is entropy, we basically need to stick this inside and that inside this definition of entropy. Okay. And what we obtain eventually, so we're having S, a sum of I, Fi multiplied by Ei, okay, minus, sorry, minus 1 over beta, okay, log of z, okay, divided by t. Okay, so we're eventually obtaining that s is, ah, I'm missing 1 over t over here. So, s is 1 over t, sum of i, fi, ei, minus k Boltzmann log of z. So you see that this formula over here and that formula over there and that formula over there are really different. Okay? So is the entropy something different? What is entropy then? Is it just the number of states or it's something that is related to the probabilities to be in the different states and the energies of the different states and the partition function? Okay? It looks like we have two different definitions of entropy or more importantly, it looks like we don't really know what entropy is. Okay? And we really don't. We know that this is something related to heat maybe, okay? temperature, heat. We know that it is somehow was mentioned to us that it describes the disorder. What is disorder? We don't really know. Okay? Um, so what is entropy? So in 1940, around 1940, Claude Shannon, who was not a physicist, he was an electrical engineer, worked on information theory. He basically, oh you. He has written a specific properties of entropy and disorder and associated what is disorder in the system, how I measure disorder in the system, and what is entropy of the system, and the, how they are exactly related to each other. So he basically wrote down a formula, hey, we won't write it down, that's generalized whatever we have been using so far. Because he said, well, Look, I don't really understand this entropy. I know that it's somehow related to the number of states. I need to describe disorder and how the system is disordered. And also, I need to find a formula that will generalize stuff that I already know. I know that this is for a microcanonical ensemble. I know that this guy is for a canonical ensemble. I need to write something which is much more general than those two relations. And I know that it's somehow related to the amount of states. Now, he was concerned what disorder is. So usually, we associate disorder with a mess, right? We look on the, a mess, you can come up into my uh, office and look on my messy table, okay? And can you say, well, your table is messy, okay? Is it disordered, okay? And mess and disorder is a very different things according to Shannon. Shannon says the following things. 
mess is one thing. Disorder is the amount of states that your function or your system can actually occupy. Right? You're, if you have a mess on your table, but you're saying that this is the only state that it's possible. You shift my pencil a little bit from right to left, I cannot stand it, I will return it to its original place. It will still look to you as a mess, but for me there is only one specific state that's possible. Shannon will tell you, well, the amount of disorder to you is zero, because there is only one state that is possible for the system. The moment that you have many states, the more states you have, the more accessible state you have, the more disordered your system is. So you associate disorder not with the amount of mess, because I don't know what mess is, but with the amount of possible states that your system can occupy. Okay? And he came up with a specific way of how to measure it. He postulated it, and he basically generalized those two formulas. Okay? So what we will do on Tuesday is we're going to write the postulate of Claude Shannon and Claude Shannon entropy, and we will see that it provides to us a generalization of entropy. Right? Okay, see you on Tuesday.